Hi, everyone. Okay, it's half seven, so we're going to get started. You all ready? All good. Okay, great. Okay. So just want to say hello to everyone who's watching. Um, thank you for attending our first dog training webinar. My name is Brona White. I'm joined today by colleagues Zach Collins, who's helping with the co-hosting of this event, and Ed Ford, who is here to answer any questions that may come up in the area of feeding and pet food. So just want to introduce our uh, panelists for today, Alex Petrilli. Hello, good morning. Is a dog trainer. And a lot of you may have met Alex already at uh, in-store events that we've had. So just want to thank Alex for your time and um, for being here today to share your knowledge with us. So a couple of things just <clears throat> before we get started, it should be over by about half 12. We are recording it, so we'll share it later. If you've missed anything or if you want to watch it back or share it with someone who might be interested, you can do that. And you can submit your questions on the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So we will <clears throat> we'll go through questions that we got in by email with Alex first. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, any other questions that come in during the course of the Q&A, we'll go through at the end. So, Alex, loads of questions came in by email over the weekend. And we are going to start, I think, with um, a really common question about recall, and especially with puppies. Mm. So a lot of people, um, they're finding it difficult to, to get their puppies to come back to them. They're not listening to them. They seem to be distracted by other things. Even if they have plenty of space to do the training in, they just can't seem to get the puppies to come back. Yeah. So. Uh, and I mean, this is a quite uh, normal of a puppy, right? Um, so let's do a step back on that one. Um, if I was uh, uh, to train a working dog, and by working dog, I mean a guide dog, for example, um, training with a guide dog would not start officially until he's 14 months old. So uh, in the first 14 months, we do very, very basic training. Um, we don't uh, do the full recall training yet. We teach them the name and everything else, but we don't expect a dog at that age to come back every time he's called. Um, that's just... Uh, not realistic um and if you've seen videos of uh, dogs coming back straight away that's fine you know you can do it as a game they might do it once out of 10 times but that's not what the puppy is supposed to do you know a puppy is supposed to learn to come back to you um in a, um, an environment where there is no distractions and then later on in life we're going to teach them to be able to come back with distraction. So in general, the rule is this one. So um, I've seen dogs that don't come back uh, many for many different reasons. So first of all, in training, you need to start when there is zero distraction. So you, you create an environment where you teach the dog to come. So usually you teach them their, their dog's name first. That means when I called my dog's name, he actually started looking at me. And then I'm going to have to add the recall word that could be come. Now, how do I do that? Well, first of all, I start in my kitchen. I don't go out in the in the dog park and start doing it. Unless I can get 100% recall in my kitchen, in my back garden, when there is no distraction, I am not ready to go out yet. Okay, so does that mean I shouldn't let my dog off, off the lead? ever until he's perfectly on recall. No, that's not the point. The point is uh, you go towards your dog, you keep, you do always, you let the dog off the lead where it's safe to do so, but you can't expect a 10 month old puppy to come back to you while he's playing with another dog. That's just not going to happen. Now, what is going to happen is if you teach that correctly from the very beginning, once he's a bit older later on, he will be able to come back. Now. The other important things about recall, and you've probably seen many videos of it, um, where there is a dog owner recalling the dog a thousand times. That's the, one of the biggest mistakes when we do recall. Recall needs to happen once. You can't keep calling the dog one, two, three, five, 20 times. Um, if you start doing so, the dog is gonna start learning to not to listen to you anymore. And then, you know, he knows you're going to call him again and again and again. Now, you need to take a look at the, at the puppy in a similar way you see a one-year-old kid. So you bring your kid to the park and you let them play with the other kids. 
you're not expecting them to, to come back as soon as you say, okay, that's it, it's time to go back home. That's what the puppy looks like. Now, at their best, a dog is always gonna have the intelligence of a toddler, at their best. So at their best, you're always gonna have a two and a half year old kid. So um, the expectation I think has changed a lot in the last number of years. We all want perfect dog very quickly and uh, forgetting about everything else is going on. Um, and I love to do the example of a working dogs because that'll give you a, a perspective into what dog training looks like. If I was going to train a guide dog, he would do very basic training until he's 14 months. Then he would go for 20 to 25 weeks training session, proper advanced training, and then an extra 10 weeks later on. So you're talking about dogs that have been trained at their best from when they are 14 months until when they are 18, 19 months. And that's with a professional trainer and being trained a number of hours every day. If you spend five minutes a day on the recall, that will give you a very good recall later on in life. If you spend one hour a week, uh, just once a week, that will give you an average recall. Um, why is that? Because dogs have very short attention span. And whenever we're doing training, we want to get the best out of them. So if we do five minutes a day of recall, it's much better than trying to do that one hour at the end of the week. Um, and five minutes is very, very simple to do it. You'll get two people, one on the one side of the garden, one on the other side of the garden. You keep the dog, the other one called the dog. You keep him there until he's ready to go to you. And then you release him when you see him that he's actually interested in the person. Um, if I'm in the dog park and I really want to recall the dog, then I go towards him. And then I use something like, a piece of ham, a piece of cheese, a piece, a piece of frankfurters. Um, but remember, it's essential with dogs, uh, and we do that with working dogs. So there is no reason not to do it with 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 uh, with pets. That is a positive association with something. So that means that every time you're doing something good, you're gonna get rewarded. How long do I keep the reward? Well, I'm gonna keep the reward until my dog knows how to do it 100%. Once he does know how to do 100%, then I start slowing down or reducing the treats I'm giving him. Um, and then I'm going to remove it completely. The problem is starts when you always reward the dog every single time and don't start removing the treat. Um, if my dogs know how to do the seat and I've been training the seat with treats, then he starts to remove the treats. You can't keep it on for the rest of his life. Otherwise, your dog is only going to do it if you have a piece of uh, treat, a treat in your hand. Also, with puppies, it's very easy, especially when they are food motivated. And then it, it depends on the dogs. Not every dog is food motivated in the same way. Um, some dogs are more toy motivated, so I would use more toys as a reward. And some dogs are more food motivated. So first things you need to understand about rewarding is what does motivate your dog? I would say 80% of dogs are food motivated and 20% are toy motivated, depends on the breeds as well. I mean, if you have a Labrador, most probably is gonna be uh, food motivated. And if you have maybe a Jack Russell, might be uh, toy motivated. So you can get a tennis ball or something else, but it's essential that every time the dog is doing something right, he's gonna get rewarded. Um, that's how it start the recall. Um, it's a very difficult because owners, especially of, a, of, of puppies, um, they see the dog when he's very young, and I'm talking about nine, 10, 11 weeks, they would follow them everywhere. But then the dog is start getting a, a different type of behavior, it's changing. Now he's becoming nearly like a teenager, so he stopped listening to you. So the 10 month is probably one of the most difficult age, and it lasts from 10 to 14. That's when the dog says, want to explore, he feels a bit stronger, he feels invincible. So he thinks he can go wherever he wants and he doesn't need to come back every time. Now, my the best way, do it 100% at home, then move to the back garden, then do it uh, with distraction. But you need to get 100% first. Okay, okay. And you know, speaking of, of dogs um, wanting to be independent and stuff, we actually had a lot of questions in about dogs who people are struggling to keep them contained in their gardens. So they're disappearing. And um, just trying to think of something specific here that came in. Um, can't keep it inside the garden. And also, um, they, they're 
not a fan of the collars and a few people were wondering what you think of the collars you know that you put on the dogs to keep them within their territory some people are you trying to use them but then the dogs won't move with them on and some people are wondering you know should they try use those at all or is there a better way to keep the dog um within their garden what type of collar are we talking about electric mm. collars here you know the i think they're talking about the you know the ones that keep them within the boundaries of the garden yeah, it's, um, it's a difficult one. I'm in generally totally against anything that is like an electric collar because it's, um, it's not a training device. Um, it, it can be, I understand in some area can be useful. Um, I just totally against them and I'm totally against them for many different reasons. The first one is when I was working at the uh, DSPCA, I've seen so many dogs being um lost because you know they what happened with the with the electric collars is before they get very close to the to the line they hear a sound and then immediately after the sound then they get a little shock um that electric shock once he passed the boundary again is only going to last until he passed the boundary for so long and once the dog is smart enough and understand well if i go far enough and then i don't get it anymore then i'm out and once I'm out, I'm going to get also an electric shock when I come back in. And then, so that means I'm not going to want to go back in. And then I keep going out. Um, it, it's a difficult one. I do understand in the, in the especially if you have, um, living in Dublin, um, we don't have the same type of problem because our gardens, A, are much smaller. And B, they, they usually are within a fence. Um, uh, it's difficult the the city dogs versus the the, the country dogs here. Um, I'm on for if he's a pet, then I mean to keep the dogs inside or within an area that is uh, um, is safe to do so. If he's a working dog, then you're allowed to stay outside all the times because you know go out working and everything. Then is is acceptable. But if he's a pet, the dogs doesn't enjoy to stay outside by itself. The do dog is a, dogs are companion animals. So companion animals, we have this idea that, you know, he likes to stay outside. Dogs do don't like to stay outside by themselves. Dogs are companions. So their job, their, their primary job is to be a companion. So if they can't stay with the, within your, your, your home, then they don't have a job anymore. And that's gone. So I'm, I think, you know, the best way to keep a dog that is keep running away is... And I know it's it's a difficult one, right? Is uh, you, you can't potentially fence everything, and it might be difficult to fence everything. Then it needs to be under control. So if it's a need to be under control, it needs to be within your house. Um, you're not going to train a dog that you're not while you're not there. So it's very very difficult for you to be able to train a dog if you're not there, being able to give them the command. Um, so they. Um, I don't see the value of the uh, electric colors in general. Uh, they used to be quite popular in the in the nineties, um, and then they went disappearing um, because the the job of a dog has changed has changed completely. Um, even what was considered a country dog that would be outside most of the time now dogs are being getting more and more inside their home. So the the the, the electric colors are uh, mostly gone, um, and plus there is the the old problem of the electric shocks like is uh, every time you're doing something not good instead of having a positive association you have a negative association with actually hurtful association um and if you try and I, one of the things i used to do with my um with my trainers was to try an electric collar on themselves to see the feeling of it and it's not a positive experience. You actually feel the electricity going through your body, even if it's minimal, you can actually feel it and it goes all the way into your body. Um, and if you got an electric shock before, even by just touching a plug or something like that, you do know what the problem is. And you, I don't think is you're gonna train a dog in that way. And you're not gonna keep him within a, a boundaries. If the dogs want to go out, is he gonna be able to go out? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And Sorry, actually, that's not um, the answer people want, but that's the no, real I know. answer. <laughs> yeah, I know. But look, I guess people want the truth as well, Alex. Um, <clears throat> so we had a completely opposite question to that in that someone who has a six month old 
follows them everywhere around the house, which, as you say, is exactly like having a toddler. They can't even go yeah. to the bathroom by themselves. Um, so she's wondering, does she start putting them in the crate for short periods of time? But, you know, she doesn't want to make the crate a prison either. Um, he's only in it at nighttime at the moment. Mm. And you're, the, the crate, we need to start looking at it in a different way. The crate is not a prison. The crate is, you need to start looking at as we see for a, a baby, uh, a cot mm -hmm. is a safe place for them to stay, but it's also a place where they need to learn to have their own independence, um, especially these days. And I would say most of our dogs are going to are gonna face a big problem going forward because we've been spending so much more time at home than ever before. Separation anxiety was already a massive issue. Um, and now it's just going to get worse. Um, it's going to get worse because we have the dogs with us all the time. Um, my suggestion is during the day, you do need to find, start with maybe five, 10 minutes outside of your of the room where you are, in the crate, with a couple of things to chew, maybe a Kong, maybe something that uh, is, can keep them entertained for a few minutes, and start with five minutes and start building it up. The crate is not a prison. Uh, create a, a great um, devices to be used um, with, with puppies to teach them to learn to say by themselves. Um, that say by yourself is actually okay. Um, uh, if we create separation anxiety and every time, and there are going to be moments where you're going to have to leave the dog by himself for a couple of hours, you know, that's going to be a very negative time for the dog. While if we are teaching them from very young age um, that, you know, you go into the crate um, and there is a difference between puppies and adult dogs. So if you never use the crate, you can't just take a crate out and put the dog into a crate because, yes, he would see it as a prison. So we need to teach him slowly. Um, it doesn't just happen overnight. Um, but, you know, you can start feeding the dog in the crate, keep the door open, uh, just put the, 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 the food inside there, teach him to... Get, get a positive association with the crate, but the crate is essential. Um, I would say that your crate is going to be good for at least until the dog is a year old. It, it doesn't have to be there all the times at all. Once he's six months, he can be out of the crate most of the day. Um, I would probably put him back for an hour or two um, during the day away from you so that the dogs learn to stay away from you. But yes, that's an essential. If you don't want to use the crate, you don't have to. But the dogs need to still stay away from you. So even if he's in a different room, in the utility room, or uh, uh, in uh, in you you remove yourself from where the dog is, the dog cannot come with you every time. You can also put uh, baby gates, you know, so that the dog is in a different room if you want to leave the door open at the beginning. But the most important thing is, he will get five minutes of barking. And that's that's going to happen because especially if, if there is a bit of separation anxiety, the dog will express the separation anxiety by barking um, and it can be very difficult for an owner uh, listening to the to the dog barking, especially when you're maybe you're trying to do a Zoom call, maybe you're trying to uh, speak with a friend. So that's not a good time for doing the training. Um, I would say I know the dog is not going to bark for the first five, 10 minutes. I'm going to find the time of the day where I can't give them the time. So I'm actually in a different room, but I'm actually training the dog. Um, and that is essential for having a, a well-behaved dog in the future. Um, but it's also good for the crate, it's good for, especially when you have a um, uh, and young happy dog and you have visitors at home hopefully sometime soon we're going to be able to get visitors in our houses again and you'll see your puppies might going to get very excited when a new visitor come in it's good to have a crate so that the dog can go in for 10-15 minutes until he relaxed and then he can come out again mm. yeah okay and speaking of dogs <laughs> getting um <clears throat> over excited about visitors a lot of questions came in about how to stop them from constantly barking when the doorbell rings and how to stop them jumping up on people. Yeah, okay, so let's start with the, uh, the, the doorbell. The, um, so um, that's again is a, uh, is a training. Um, it's a training we do with uh, uh, a lot of dogs and I would say 90% of the dogs out there have that problem. As soon as the, uh, the doorbell rings, they're gonna start barking. And uh, you can actually train the dog to stop doing that. You know, so what we teach the dogs when the doorbell rings is either to go and get a toy, to go get something to chew, or go back in his crate. So we reverse the training to do something different. Okay. So how do you do it? Well, you need to give him, you need to teach him when there is no real visitor. So you don't start by waiting for a visitor to start teaching the dog. That's, that's not the time to teach 
anything to the dog. That's the time to uh, uh, limit the, the damage you're gonna get out of that that situation. So uh, don't wait for a real busy dog. Get a friend, get to your kids, get your husband, your wife, go there, ring the doorbell. When the doorbell arrives, take a treat, bring him to his crate, reward him, and then let him go either to the visitor if the dog is calm, or wait for the visitor to come uh, into the room. And you'll do that many times, like you do the sit, like you do the down, like you do the stay. Uh, teach the dog at, from a very young age, doorbell means go to your crate, get a treat, get rewarded. Otherwise, is you're gonna get the opposite. Doorbell means that the dog is gonna get a, a barking until you open the door. Um, then how do I, once the visitor comes inside the house, how do I actually teach my dog not to jump up on visitor? Well, first of all, if you have a very uh, a dog that jump up on everybody, then he, again, you need to start with yourself um, to teach him to stop jumping up on you. You can't expect the dog to stop jumping up on other people if he's still jumping up on you. So everything starts from either when you leave the house and when you come back the house from the from outside. Don't allow the dog from jumping up. So if the dogs jump up, you need to turn your back. Remember, dogs see, um, they, they can't differentiate between a negative and positive attention. The attention is attention. It doesn't matter if it's negative. So if you say stop, stop jumping or whatever, or positive uh, attention by rewarding him, by petting him, by saying hello, everything else. The best way with your dog to, to stop him from jumping up is to stop giving him attention. So as soon as you come back home, do not give attention to your dog. I know it's very hard, it's very difficult because you know it, there is that excitement for you and for the dog, don't give any attention. When you come back home, ignore the dog for the first few minutes. Then when the dog is calm, rewarding. We use rewarding system for the past 20 years because we realized before it was more of a negative uh, type of training. When I started 25 years ago, if the dog was doing something bad, you would give him a slap on the nose. If he was doing something bad, he would use a choke chain. That type of training never worked for me. I just didn't see the, the, didn't, didn't see the value of having a dog that is actually afraid of you. Now, what we did is since then, we actually start applying the same rules as we applying with kids. There is much more positive association with things and rewarding system than a negative association. Now, with the, unfortunately with the dogs, you can't say I'm removing your iPad from you. So the removing things don't really work. So what it works is more there because there's so much food and toy motivated, you're actually giving them something. Time out, you can do it by putting them in a, in a different room. But that's again, in general, it doesn't really give you um, a, a good uh, a good dog. What it gives you a good dog is a dog that is actually, he understands that whenever he's doing something good, he's gonna get rewarded, um, either by toy or by food. If you start, if people are start having, especially because vets might say, well, you can't give them so many treats during the day. Well, but what you can do is take the quantity of food he's gonna have during the day, put it on the side, use part of that for rewarding the dog. Especially if you have a young puppy, I would use most of his food as a rewarding system. I hardly gonna use uh, a football uh, when the dog is zero to six months, because what I do is I, I use his, his food during the day for recalling, coming back, sit down, stay, stop jumping up and so on. So use their food quite a lot during the day instead of just giving him a big portion of food at nighttime. Um, training doesn't have to be difficult. Um, training needs to be, I, I would say between your recall, your seat, your down, your stay, I would probably spend around 15 minutes every day with, your, with my dogs. If I'll spend 15 minutes a, a day with the dog, maybe five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the afternoon, five minutes in the evening, that's gonna give you a much better dog than if you do uh, one hour training every now and then. Yeah, I guess consistency is the key as well, Alex, what, you know, not giving in to give treats in certain situations and stuff. Look, is uh, consistency is the most difficult thing um, because we don't have the treats with us or because this is not the right time to train the dog or because I forgot about it because it's difficult. Dogs are animals that uh, are so 
works so much better when you use consistency because uh, you will see they they start changing the behavior even if you make a change inside your house if you move something around they might not like it if you're used to go out at 10 o'clock and you go out at 10 30 between 10 and 10 30 without looking at the time they start behaving in a different way dogs need consistency much more than human do and if you stop that then you're going to create a problem um but we also you know i'm also looking at from a, a nor like i don't spend hours and hours and hours every day training my dogs you know life doesn't work like that you know i have so many other things i have kids i have to go to work i have to i have a family things to do you know i don't expect you to spend you know hours and hours of the training every day but the, to trying to find there are three four things that you must do first one is the number of walks you do every day there are three walks a day that you need to do one hour long walk, it's not the solution. The solution is smaller walks for three times. That's gonna stop the dog from pulling on the lead. That's gonna stop the dog from being excited for the first 10 minutes and then being tired for the last 10. You know, three walks a day are essential. And again, the walks depends on the, how old is your dog, how, uh, how energetic is your dog, but. If you can find 10 minutes, 15 minutes in the morning and, uh, and then in the afternoon and then in the evening again, that's much better than a very long walk. Now, if you want to do a very long walk, that's fine. Okay. You know, if your dog can do it, please do a very long walk, but still find 10 minutes during the day, one for the morning and one for the afternoon. Because otherwise you're going to have a dog pulling on the lead like mud for the first 10 minutes. And that's a reality yeah. because the dog is excited. He needs to go out and that's what he's going to do. Yeah, a lot of people actually um, question, uh, sent in questions about pulling on the lead. They just can't, the, do the dog is taking them for a run and they, they can't stop to talk to any of their neighbors or whatever. Um, is, that, is that the way around that, to do more shorter walks more often maybe? Yes, and, but also, you know, there are so many devices out there that will help you to achieve that. The first things we need to teach the dog is, is not to stop pulling. The first things we need to teach the dog is to slow down. Uh, dogs have a much faster pace than human. So um, what we would use is either a non-pull harness or a head collar in order to learn very, very quickly how to slow down. Um, non-pull harnesses are e easier to use they don't require much training in the sense that, you know, you can just put it on and just reward the dog when he's not pulling and they're fine. They are not as effective as head collars. Head collars are more effective. So you will see them, the, the head collars with the... Um, actually, can I share a picture? Uh, can't, can you give me the... You should be able to, yeah. It says, uh, you disabled me. You probably yeah. don't want me to share negative things. <laughs> Work away, please. Uh, there you go. <laughs> So let me see if I can. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. So that color would look like something like this, right? Okay. Um, this is a very, very good device. Um, it requires two, three things, really. Um, first of all, it requires a lead that has two connections, one that goes around the color and one that goes around the head color. Uh, so it is a lead that would look like something like this. So you have one that would go around the collar and the other one that would go around the head collar. Yeah, um, pretty sure we have it, these in stock, actually. The guys can... You know, and it's essential. You cannot... Uh, you should not use the head collar with a single lead. And I'll explain you in, in a second why. Um, now, these are very good devices. They require a bit of training in order to learn. And you will get to the beginning five, 10 minutes where the dog is going to try to uh, remove that collar. It, the dog doesn't accept it straight away. So it requires a bit more training than uh, a non-pull harness. Um, if the dog is not pulling that much, then something like this, a non-pull harness works very well. But again, you need a lead that has two connections. Why do we need a lead that has two connections? Well, the, the main reason why we need a lead with two connections is because what we're teaching the dog is to slow down. Um, and both the head collar and the non-pull harness work in a similar way. So you, with one end, you hold the lead that is connected to the collar. And with the other end, you're practically steering the dog, similar to the way the horses uh, works, that you know, you're slowing down because the moment that my dog cannot look straight, he's not gonna go as fast. Now, if I put too much tension on his nose all the times, 
then the dog is going to try to pull it away by moving the head on the other side. That needs to be used very, very gently. You're holding the, the lead that is attached to the collar with your left hand, and with your other one, you're maneuvering the dog very, very slowly and without putting too much pressure. If you're giving a massive pressure, the dog is not gonna like because you're moving, you're, it practically is like somebody takes your head and move it all the way to the side. You know, your, your head is not used to do that and it's either it's for the dog. So you slowly uh, uh, slowing it down. That it's not stopping the dog from pulling on the lead, but it'll start reducing it and by slowing him down. Training is then what is gonna help him with. And again, what I do is I do three, four steps. If the dog is start pulling, I'll stop. I'll call him back and we restart. It does, uh, pulling on the lead is number one problem for dog owners, you know, and you probably see some dogs are much better than others. Um, and what we realize is, well, dogs that do tend to have 15 minutes walk three times a day are much more inclined to slow down because they have not the same excitement of the uh, dogs that walk only for one hour. Um, the other things is very important during dog training, especially with uh, um, stop pulling, is by understanding that you know if the dog pulls, you don't pull him back. That's not because otherwise you're teaching him to pull more. And you you can try these uh, tonight uh, by just taking a dog lead and give one side to your husband or wife, and you take the other side and uh, you start pulling, and you will see the natural reaction of uh, of the other person is to pull back without telling him anything, just give him a one end of the, of the lead, you hold the other lead, then start pulling, you will see that he would pull or she will pull back. That's what the dog do. You know, he pulls, you pull back. You pull back, he pulls again. So then you create tension. The point of what we are teaching the dog to do is not to stop pulling, but to have a loose leash pulling. So that means that, you know, as soon as he finish uh, and he can feel that the leash is in tension, it's gonna slow down. And that's how we're teaching him to stay beside you. It's, it's not easy. It's number one problem. It takes time. I would say um, on average, it can take anything between a couple of months to six months to stop the dog from pulling completely. Um, is um, um, The best dogs that we had, uh, probably within a month, you will see a massive change straight away, especially with the um, working dogs, uh, by using at colors, slowing it down completely. Um, but don't start too early either. You know, uh, I would use the head color very quickly on, on puppies, maybe when they are four or five months, um, but I don't expect perfection. You know, um, with puppies, I never expect perfection. If they can learn and they can understand, then I'm happy because that means once they're older, they're going to know how to do it. Um, but if I start later on, that's fine. Uh, but if your dog pulls on the lead a lot, maybe start with a, a non-pull harness um, and then move on to the head collar um, just because it's easier. Head collar requires training. You need to teach him that the head collar is a positive device and it's not a negative device. But I've done a couple of videos and maybe I'll, I'll share it uh, with you, uh, Brona, so you can yeah. uh, uh, put it on your website. So I've done a couple yeah. of videos on uh, stop pulling, uh, uh, recall, um, stop jumping up, um, sit down. So maybe you can uh, share it with, mm. uh, um, with the participants as well. Yes, I will. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. Um, another one, we had a couple of questions from people um, where their dogs are stealing things like uh, gloves or, hi, Alva, I know you sent in your question about your dog grabbing hats off your head and it's difficult to get these things back from the dog um and sometimes i think you know you need to um give the dog a treat to actually get the dog to come back with the hat or the gloves. Yeah. so what do they do there but that's fine that's uh, you know there is it depends if it's more of a game or in general 90 percent of the time is a game yeah. so the first things i would teach the dog is to uh, learn one command that is leave it uh leave it uh, is a great command that the uh, every dog owner should be able to teach their dogs very, very quickly. And the way to do it is uh, you take um, 10, 15 treats and put it in your uh, left hand and then take one of them and put it on the ground. And uh, as soon as the dog goes for it, you cover it. And then you tell him to leave it by showing him with your other hand, your left hand, that is actually a treat on the other hand. So what we're teaching the dog is that by not touching that, 
is going to get rewarded. So you will do you repeat that few 10, 15 times, and then you will see the dog is very quickly going to stop going for that treat because he knows that he's going to get rewarded from your other end. The point of this game is to teach the dog that the, the rewards come from you and he doesn't have to take things in the, that are around the house. And if you ask them to leave it, they will look for your, they will look at you for a treat. Now, slowly you can then remove the treat. And, but I use leave it as well when we are passing other dogs on the street, when he's on the lead, I'll tell him to leave it. I'll get the attention away from the other dog. I'll reward and we keep walking. Then there is another problem that is once they already taken something, how do they give it back? Um, the, something that I thought it was very, very smart, and I've seen it used by the guide dogs, is to teach them thank you. And thank you means you take something, you bring it back to me, you get rewarded and uh, for giving it back to me. Um, puppies are great to find things around the house and take it. You know, gloves, socks, uh, hats, shoes. Shoes, especially if you have puppies, you know how, uh, how much they love to chew your shoes. Well, the first thing here is anything that is around the house and is free for the dog to take, and he's a puppy, don't expect him not to take it. He will take it, you know? And if you don't give him attention, he will take it. That's why we use the crate a lot when they're puppies. When they're very young, we use the crate because it's safe to do so. So you don't have to start chasing him around the house. Chasing the dog that does already have something, it never works because he actually become a game, right? So you start chasing him, he's running away. What you teach him is, again, take a treat, call him back and show him the treat. As soon as he drop it, you reward him. You can either use drop it if you already take something, or you can use thank you. Uh, I, I've never used thank you before. I've seen it using by the guide dogs. I really liked it. I started using it with my own puppy, and it's working very well. Um, uh, again, sometimes I, I've seen her, you know, she's very smart. She goes look for the bags of my wife's. There are maybe a couple of gloves inside. She takes the gloves, bring it back to me. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I don't mind, I don't give out to the dog because the, the, if, he's, if he's in a position where the dogs can take it, then if I'm not looking, I can't expect perfection from a puppy. Puppy are like kids, they wanna play all the times. But if they bring it back instead of a, going there and chew it, then I should reward that. Now, do I reward every time? No, I do not. I should, but I don't reward every time because sometimes I don't have treats in front of me, but I still say thank you. And I still reward them in a different way by either petting the dog or by uh, just spending a couple of minutes, giving a couple of minutes of attention. Now, one thing I actually forgot that is fundamentals in order to remove treats later on in life is whenever you, whenever you, 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 you give a treat to the dog, you should have something before and something after you do. So the first things I do before I give him the treat, I say yes or well done. So I mark what is a good behavior. Um, so if my dog is doing something good, I say yes. Then I take my treat, I reward, and then I'll pet my dog. Because what I do is I'm saying yes, it is um, practically I'm telling my dog, you're doing the right things. So that means if I don't have a treat later on, it's fine. I'm still accepting you're doing the right thing. And then I'm also petting. So that means that I'm actually adding to my reward, my treat, also my attention. So that's actually a double reward you give at the beginning. So later on, when you reduce the reward, she's still going to get or he's still going to get uh, a reward by telling the dog. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Be serious patience for this, Alex. Oh, you need like pop, like I love because, you know, there is so many more puppies around the uh, uh, the cities now um, because during lockdown, um, people love to take a dog. It was great, great time for everybody. What, what sometimes people don't realize is how much work is a puppy yeah. is. Puppies are actually um, as difficult as young kids. Um, yeah. I, yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> so, you know, if you want to get a new dog, you need to realize, well, first of all, you don't need to get the puppy to have a good dogs. There are lots of old dogs, and I've seen, I've seen it when you know you go and to the shelter, get a dog that is four or five years of age. What you see is what you're gonna get. With puppies, behavior still gonna change, you know, and it's gonna change many times depending on what you did. If you're a first dog owner, I would recommend you to go for an older dog than go for a puppy because a puppy is much more work, and you need to have the time to give. 
Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Um, speaking of, of you know, patience and, and the amount of work that it takes, there's a lot of questions about how to stop your dog from digging your lawn and also how to stop them from clay biting. Okay, play biting, first of all, because that's a problem that every puppy has. Um, we don't stop um, dog from play biting. What we do is we teach bite inhibition. Um, bite inhibition is we teach the dog that when they do play biting, not to put any pressure. Um, that's gonna be essential in life to learn that the, if they are put in a situation where they do need to bite because they, um, they are either put in a corner, there is something dangerous, whatever is the reason, dogs do uh, need to learn bite inhibition. So that means they're gonna need to learn not to put too much pressure on. So what we teach with puppies and is, some people find it easier than others, some people just do not like to do that. Um, so if you don't like to do this, I'm gonna give you some tips at the end of it on what to do instead. But the best way to do it is whenever the puppy is very young, usually is between nine to 10 weeks to uh, 16, 17 weeks, is to teach them to play bite with your hands. But when you feel that they actually, the teeth are getting too sharp and they're putting too much pressure, you need to let them know. So I would say, hey, hi, that's not nice. And then I'll wait for that, their reaction. Sometimes the reaction immediately is to stop and then immediately after is to go again for it. So that's the time I'm removing myself. I'm standing up. I'm not playing with you. The dog is what's going to do next. He's going to try to bite your shoes. And that's normal. So I redirect that to something else, either uh, a toy. So I would use something like uh, these. Let me see if I can. Something like the, the rope here. OK, yeah. so redirect them towards something different. Uh, or any other toy is fine. But what I'm doing is I'll stop him from biting and start getting something else. This is not tug of war or of anything. It's more trying to redirect, okay? So it's essential to have a toy you can actually use to redirect that. Now, then I'll do it again and I'll start again and I put my hands around his mouth. And as soon as he bites again, I'll tell him again if it's too much or not. If we don't teach him that, when the dog is older, is probably going to put too much pressure because he doesn't know how to stop, okay? Now, if you don't like to put your hands in the dog's mouth, and I understand lots of people don't, what I would use is I would use uh, gardening gloves. I'll put the gardening gloves on and I'll play. But dogs do play like that. If you see dogs playing with each other when they're puppies, what they do is they go for each other's ears and they keep biting each other. Now, when mommy or the other puppies are around, they learn what bite inhibition is because if a dog goes too much, the other dog is gonna start barking at him and it's gonna let him know that that's not the way to do it. Mommy is very good on teaching the puppies how to do it, but mommy is not around anymore. So now the dogs need to still learn because they haven't learned by the time it comes to you because they usually come to you when they are seven, eight weeks old. That's very early, but they haven't learned a lot of these things. So they still need to experiment and they still need to understand what is the best way. So put gardening gloves on, but do teach them. Don't get, usually what happens is if you have kids, you will see there is one kid, the dog is enjoy play biting more. Uh, and um, most of the time is your younger kids. Um, yeah. Not all the times, but most of the time is. And that's not acceptable in the sense that you can't get two kids to play with each other by biting, okay? So if you had two kids and they were fi play fighting, you would try to stop that, okay? You don't say, okay, let's see who is the strongest one and then let's see how it's gonna come out of this. You need to intervene that. So the puppy cannot be trained by your younger kids on how to stop biting because he's gonna play biting, your kids is gonna cry, he's gonna push the dog again, away, the dog is going to go again, and that's going to end up into something that is not positive. Play biting, it needs to be a positive association, but you need to let them know when it's not good. Um, and then there was a second part of the question. Was there? Yeah, what was that? Um, sorry, now I have so many questions here. It was about digging holes in the lawn. Oh, oh yeah. yes. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. Favorite things for dogs ever, right? is uh, how to destroy your garden. If you have uh, a, a Labrador or a Golden Retriever, you know all about is uh, your garden is uh, not being used 
by you anymore because the dog's loves out to go out there and uh, and do it. So there are a few things you need to do. First of all, um, it's an instinctual thing. So the dogs need to do it. Um, so we do need to find a place where they can do it. I do tend, and I shouldn't be saying this, but I do tend to go more around the parks to let them do it. But yes, that's a good time for them to start uh, uh, digging. But the other things I used to do with my dogs, it was quite good that we had the sand pitch, uh, a sand pit, and you know, we we'll just use the, get the dog there to, um, to, to go out there and do it. You can't allow the dogs to be outside by itself and stop from training it. You can only train when you are outside. And I will stop it completely. As soon as you see that going, recall the dog and put him back on the lead or something else. But don't let him continue because it's not going to stop by itself. Um, but they also need to understand that they still need to do it. So you need to find either another place or a sand pit or something else where they can actually dig. Dogs need to dig. The beach, you know, maybe so for where we live, the beach, beach is be great. The, option. the mm. beach is a great option. The only problem with the beach is that it's like the sand pit is it only releases certain type of a smell. You need to understand, you need to start thinking from a dog's point of view. That's that digging is like watching Netflix because every time you start digging, there is a new smell coming out. And you know, you will see that sometimes dog dig, 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 and dig but there is nothing coming out. But every time he does that, there is a new smell coming out. And you know, you have to realize that dogs, from a smell point of view, they are millions of times, they can smell millions of times more than you than what you can. And that smell also release other things. What type of dogs was there? If it was another dog there, what type of other animal was there? What was inside? So for them, it's like watching television. So it's a, it's a very, very good tool for them to uh, release the stress as well. Um, but I, I understand, you know, you don't want a garden with uh, um, uh, all over the place. So you need to redirect it towards something else. Another things we do is uh, um, you can buy, um, uh, one of those mats where you can put things inside like treats and other uh, and other smells and let the dogs um, being able to find them or another things you can do is take a um, a plastic bottle uh, put a couple of treats in um, put a couple of holes in the plastic bottle add, add it around the um, the garden and let them go and find it and then let them uh, take the treats once he's, uh, they find it or if they like a tennis ball use that but you do need to understand that using their uh, olfactory uh, senses is very, very important for dogs. So you either allow them to dig or you let them go and find something else. Now, digging is also another stress release that for dogs is very important. So you do need to allow some of that. Okay, okay, great. Um, got a, another one in here from someone over the weekend who's She's got a collie cross, uh, 14 months she got it, and it's completely obsessed with cars. He's nearly five now, but is still completely obsessed with cars. So trying to chase them when they're not on the lead. And um, she's just very worried about the safety of the dog. And also, you know, it's, it's nerve wracking for drivers that come across the dog. And she said that he's not responsive to her or food or anything really at those times. He's just completely obsessed with the car. So she's yeah. wondering, is there anything? Yeah. And also he likes to chase cats. And I actually had a couple people asking about chasing cats. So um, just wondering what you think about those things. Yeah. Um, so let's start by um, Collie chasing um cars so do need to do a step back on that so um first of all it depends on the breed right um but if you have a collie that's a herding dog okay so he's now replacing uh, the sheep the cows with with the cars so that's in that's part of their genetic is not something you need to teach a collie to do to herd it's something they know how to do it it's imprint into their genetics and so the problem is what happened is when he doesn't have that job anymore he's replacing it with something else and unfortunately most of the colleagues do replace them with cars now the the difference is that they, they don't know uh and they, they, in general they are quite smart they don't get that close like they got close but they never get in in front of it but the problem is when they do that um so we need to replace that with something else and uh, you're not going to remove it you're not going to you you can't remove 
what is part of their genetics that is hurting. So that's always going to be there. What you can do is reduce it, but removing it, it's impossible. Okay, so that's, you, you know, you need to, we need to be very clear on that because you can never remove what is part of their uh, imprint, their genetic side. What we can do is um, we need to teach them to do something else. And with Collie, what I tend to teach instead of that is um, um, because mostly they are uh, dog, uh, sorry, they're um, toy motivated. Um, I tend them to, uh, to teach them to, um, to, to go to, to chase a, a tennis ball and to bring it back and everything else. Now, I don't teach him when he's in that moment because that's too late. But what I do is I'll go somewhere else, like on the beach, and teach him uh, in that way to bring the, 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 the ball back or another toy back. But what we need to do is removing that and trying to reduce it. It's very difficult and it can only work when the dog is. Uh, away from the situation. So that means we need to reduce the situation as much as possible. So that means you can't be outside on the back garden by yourself because you will start chasing the car and you will replace the, the, the sheep with the car. And that's nothing you can do in that moment is not gonna come back. But what you do need to teach him in order to stop that is a perfect recall. Now, the good things that herding dogs do have is a perfect recall, right? Is a, it means that I'll call him back. It's not that they do whatever they want. I'll call him back when I need them to, and the dogs come back. Now, I don't teach him in front of a car to come back, but I start teaching the recall. And what is so good about Collie is that they are such a smart dogs that they can actually learn very quickly other things. So you need to replace that need, that job that he created for himself, that he's earned in the cart with the perfect recall, you know, bringing the toys back, uh, bringing a tennis ball back, and then remove it and slow it down a bit. Um, I did get some very, um, some dogs that were very, very, difficult on reducing it to have a perfect recall that as soon as you call them then we're coming back to you straight away um, but they don't work together so you need to do it separately from that moment but focus on the recall a lot and focus on uh, bringing a toy back um, it's uh, the cat situation is a bit of a different situation um, it's uh, it's a long term fight between a uh, long term war between dog and cat and chasing and uh, the problem is that uh, in generally the cat is much faster is running away much quicker and it's a great chasing game and the cat most of the time gets away with no problems thanks god um because otherwise we would have a problem if the dogs was faster than the cat um but is uh, is the attention right is that's basic commands basic obedience is the leave it the, what we did before the uh, recall what we did before the giving attention to you so that situation is too late when the dog starts chasing and you can't call him back is because you're missing a few things before. Um, a, every dog, every dog out there would love to chase a cat if they could. Now, the difference is between a dog, you can actually, if, if you see the cat and you're fast enough to see it, you'll tell the dog to stop, leave it, stay beside me, break the attention, the cat is gone. There is no more of a problem out there. But also, if you have a very young puppy, is to teach him to socialize with every possible animal before. So don't if you see a cat, don't say to your dog, oh, look, there is a cat, doggy, look, there is a cat. And that's what dog owners do. You know, and then it's like, oh, the dog is start putting his ears up now. If they are on the lead, nothing is gonna happen. If it was off the lead, it would be after the cat in three seconds, right? Um, so if you don't have if you don't have that problem yet, stop bringing the dog. If you see a cat, reward them by giving attention to you. If you already have that problem, then you need to do a step back. So the step back is a perfect seat, a perfect stay. You know, the stay is a very, very good um, training command that we need to teach every dog. And stay means we start with the dog in a seat position. We'll tell him to stay. We don't walk away from the dog. We'll wait one second, we reward the dog. Then we do one step away. We'll tell him to stay. If the dog doesn't move, we go back. First is the timing. So you do it in an area where you are comfortable with 
and you start with very limited amount of time and then you increase the time. Second, you add the distraction. You go into the park, there is other dogs, you tell them to stay and then you walk away one step. The reward, you walk away 10 steps, you, you go. Teaching the dog to come back. So there are a few things you need to teach the dog from very young age. You don't expect perfection, but you teach them from very young age. First one is the seat. Seat is essential. We teach them straight away. Then is the lie down, stay, come. So we teach them come by, first of all, by teaching the names first, and then by teaching them to come, leave it. Or if you want, take it as well. You know, if you want to teach a dog to take something. If you teach these five, six commands very, very quickly from very young age, and you know that these commands are perfect inside your home, then you can start moving out. That's all you need to have a good dog. They're not going to come by themselves. They come with training. Uh, yeah. the, the, but the, the best things about dog training is that all of you can do it. Every single person can do dog training because a lot of it is common sense. You know, it's not rocket science, but you do need to understand a bit from the dog point of view. So what I'll, I'll, I'll tell you is don't look at it from a, a human point of view. You need to start looking at it from a dog point of view. Once you understand it from a dog point of view, those five commands, you can actually see it in a different way. We use rewarding with kids all the time. So if you do something good, we'll reward you. If you do something good at school, we'll reward you. And we actually use it until they are 18, 19, 20 years of age. Why can you not do the same for dogs? Why do you feel that you can't do the same for dogs? It's exactly the same. The only difference is that it's much cheaper. You don't have to use iPads and Xboxes. You need to use treats or toys. Teach a dog also, understand which one is the favorite toy of your dog. If your dog is a favorite toy, I'm gonna to tell you to do something very bad today. Go back into the house and take it away. Take it away because that toy is your rewarding toy. You will see it with police dogs all the time. That the, the dogs, when he's, uh, um, if he's, uh, the, if he's search and rescue, if he's a uh, um, uh, 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 drug detection, once the dog finds something, the trainer, the first things he does is take the, the toy and he actually play with the dog. But that toy then is taken away from the dog, and we use it as a reward. If you have it all the time, it's not a reward. It's something you expect. So if you find the best toy of your dog. Take it away, that, but don't take it away. Don't use it ever again. It's take it away and use it as a reward. Yeah. Alex, just um, on training and toys and stuff like that, if someone was going to start really actively training their dog now after listening to all this today, <clears throat> would you recommend a couple of things that they would find useful for that? Yeah. So um, first of all, uh, let me see if I can show you this one. So a um, couple of toys I think are uh, very, very important. Well, first of all is the Kong. Yeah. Kong is a must have in everybody's home. Um, Kong is great uh, as a chewing toys and you will see they usually come in three different colors, uh, four different colors. Uh, you have the pink and, and, and baby blue one that are poppy one. So you use them until they are uh, seven, eight month old and they're they quite soft. And what you do is you could put a couple of treats inside. Um, I tend to put a, either uh, some uh, water or something else just to keep the treats together. And then I put it in the freezer. Once I put it in the freezer, I leave it overnight. You put it inside uh, one of those uh, um, plastic bags, leave it overnight in there. Once you come out, you actually all the treats inside are frozen and it takes a, a while for the dog to go through. So you put them that in the crate if the dog is very young and you let them chew it. Now, once it got a bit older, you move that to the red one. If you have some extreme chewer, you move on to the black one. So the black one is for your Labrador, three years of age that it would chew and destroy everything. That's a very, very strong one. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have a dog that is, and it comes in different sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large, depending on the breed. But this is a must have. Another toy that is a must have for me is a, a soft toy. So um, a soft toy that I, especially with the, with puppies, either a rope, 
or uh, um, any toys that I can actually use to redirect them mm. towards, I actually do it quite a bit. Um, if the dog is not a big chewer, you know, another soft toy, what, like a squeaky toy is also quite good. But what is squeaky toys, we need to teach them the ones that once they, they can feel the squeak, like once you hear the noise, you stop. The squeaky toys is not meant for the dogs to destroy the toy within five minutes. As soon as you hear the squeak, you get a reward, you get a treat, you take the, do the toy away. The squeak is the, the reward. Okay. You don't let him go over and over and over and over again. And then anything else it is chewing. Dogs need to chew from zero to uh, 24 months. They are massive chewer. You need, if you don't want them to chew things around the house, you need to have other device to chew. Um, if your dog is, you know, toy motivated, a tennis ball is great. Now let's make sure you don't turn the toy uh, motivation into an obsession. You know, if you have one of those dogs that you throw the ball, come back, he drop it to you, and he doesn't do anything else until you throw it back again, and he start barking at you until you throw it again, you need to remove that immediately. Obsession is just as bad as uh, um, uh, as uh, as they not coming back or anything else. So the obsession is something you want to stop completely. Okay, okay. Um, can I, I just want to cover off a couple of other things that came in before we tackle the ones that came in just during the webinar. Um, <clears throat> a couple of people who um, they have rescue dogs who are afraid of new things and another one who her dog went to a different kennel to usual and came back and is now attacking small dogs. So just, you know, around attacking smaller dogs, I guess, and, and also dogs who are afraid of things. How do we get around that? Yeah, that's a, that can become a problem as well. Um, first of all, we don't know what has happened when you brought the dog to that kennel, right? Yeah. It could be many different reasons. They, um, with dogs, it can be just a, a negative association. Just by having a small dogs barking beside him, it doesn't mean they was attacked by the dog. It could have been just a negative association with the situation. So we need to remove, we need to transform the negative association into a positive association. Um, you know, if you, you start with the distance, so once the, 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 the small dog is far away, you'll get his attention, you give him his tennis ball, or you give him a reward, and you start building it from there. Um, desensitize something that is the dog is not happy with you need to start with short and small steps right um it could be noises or it could be animals or it could be um it could be cars it could be anything else anything it works in the same way you desensitize them from what they don't like you know to accept them you're not going to desensitize them from not liking it to love them that's not the goal the goal is to accept them so the goal is to accept the dog 10 meters away, then bring it down to five meters away, then bring it down to two meters away and so on. But you start from a very, uh, for, from the maximum possible distance, and then you start reducing it. The one thing you always need to remember is reward. You know, it's very, very simple. You know, is you start with, when you see a dog far away from you, you start rewarding him. So now when, remember, we are reversing it. So before he had a negative association with it, and the negative association could have been you being away from them and a, a smaller dog barking all night beside them. That was a negative association. That means the small dogs sent you away. It's nowhere near to the truth. You brought him to the kennel for whatever reason, but that's, he had a negative association with that. Now we are reversing it. So that means every time I see a cat, if my dog doesn't like a cat, I'll reward him. What is essential with dogs is that you don't build the negative association with more negative association. So if you see a cat, you don't pull him back straight away because then it means you need to be careful of something. Or if you see a car, you don't pull him back or tell him no because that's create build on the negative association. Now it's not going to love them more, it's going to hate them more. So we need to reverse that. And how do you do that? By giving them something positive instead. And, and that works with everything. Uh, I had lots of dogs that came to me before with serious aggression issues. Aggression could be for many different reasons. It could either be because um, the dog has proper aggression, and that's not most of the cases. Most of the cases is, uh, is being afraid of something. Um, but independently, if the dog is afraid or it just doesn't like it, you're never going to remove aggression altogether. 
uh, aggression is always going to be there and it's going to be uh, it's going to come out if uh, the situation is not positive what we can do is reduce the aggression to a point that is you don't even notice it. Um, I had lots of working dogs, especially when I was uh, uh, training a, a sh um, uh, search and rescue dogs where uh, most of the good dogs we had were um, German Shepherd and these were working dogs. They were dogs that were they had a job that was to find missing people. Um, a lot of them had some aggression with other dogs, but when they were working, they weren't even looking at them, you know, and uh, because they were focusing on something else. Now, if you put them in a in, in a house together in the back garden with nothing to do, they would probably have killed each other, you know. So you just build it in a different way. Um, first of all, you need to understand that dogs need to have a job, and is either being a companion or have something else. But the dogs need a job, and ninety percent of the dogs out there, pets their job is to be a companion. And in order to be a companion, they need to create a positive association with you and with everything that is going around. If the dog has aggression issues, we can reduce it, but they need to have positive association with that. Anything the negative, you need probably need to do a step back and start rebuilding it again. The problem is you'll see some dogs that are, when they have that aggression out, nothing is going to stop them. It's not that you're going to take a treat out and they're going to take it they're gonna be focused 100% on the smaller dog or whatever else they don't like. So that means we are too far. So we need to take five, six step back. So that means that they, we need to teach them, first of all, not to bark when the dog is very far away and then start reducing that. Dog training, as I said before, is it's not rocket science, but you need to take step, small steps. Um, no dogs are going to learn anything very fast, uh, uh, even the smartest one out there. So just start very, very with small steps. Mm, okay. Just following on from the aggression, but there, um, there was a question in from someone who said her dog, she thinks he's resource guarding. So if he, for example, got sick and someone came into the room, he would start to growl. And if they tried to take his chew toys or anything off him, he would do the same. Um, and they're just wondering how to handle that. Yeah, lots of dogs have resource guarding and puppies as well. You know, if you ever taken a pig's ear and give it to the dog and then trying to take it away from them, then you will see that how difficult it is. And resource guarding start with, uh, with, with I, I usually start with a, a, a dog football. And what I do is I take a football and I put one kibble inside. I put it down. And what's happened after the dog finish one kibble, he's going to look at me like to say, Excuse me, mister, where's the rest? <laughs> and then I'll take the, the ball away from him. And now I put mm. two cables. What I'm teaching him is, well, you want food, that has to come from me. So that means I'll take it and move it and, and give it back to you whenever I want. So that means I'll put two cables in and then I'm going to have to take it away again. So I slowly, I'll start teaching him that, you know, me taking it away, it means more is going to come back. And what I do teach him as well is then once I start feeling that, you know, it doesn't have the same, I might put 10, 15 cables in and then in the middle, I would remove it. Now, as soon as I remove him, I'll reward him and tell him, if I remove something from you, something good is going to happen. And that's I start doing it then with everything else. If I see that he's resource guarding a toy, I start doing the same. I'll take his attention away. I'll reward him. I'll take the toy away and then I'll give it back. The essential part is giving it back immediately after, you know, and then being able to take it away. If you haven't done, if you've seen that your dog doesn't have that problem, don't wait for the problem to arrive to start doing it. Start doing it straight away. From when the puppy is very young, take the football up and down every five seconds and leave it back. And the same things with toys. You take them away and reward. Don't give out. If you tell him no, remember what I said before, don't reverse, don't make it more negative you make it positive turn it around okay okay um okay just quite a random one here someone whose dog howls when certain music is playing and it tends to be when it's reed instruments Lovely. so i'm thinking Sing that it. must be something to do with the pitch or something is it yeah and it's a different pitch and you'll see that uh, you know different pitch i would give a different uh, um, different reaction from dogs. Um, I peach, you can give, you can get the reaction. I have seen dogs before that love the music and they love singing when the music was played. Um, if there is nothing negative, it's fine. You know, yeah. I think is, they're uh, they're worried that it might be causing them distress because he howls. So it much. could be it could be the distress because the pitch is very high. 
um, so reduce the volume a bit and see if that makes a difference um, or remove the dog in a different room. But you'll see, you know, the distress can be seen in a different way. You know, you'll uh, call the dog back to you, see if the dog is happy out, see if he's uh, engaging with something else. Uh, um, and also then, in, even if it is a distress, we can reduce it. You know, if you really love that music that you can't stay away from it, then you reduce it. So you can start putting that music at low volume when he's having his feed. So again, remember, everything is positive association. He's having a feed, he's hearing the music, he's getting rewarded by, you know, by okay. getting the okay. fed. Yeah, okay, good idea. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the questions that came in since we started the webinar. Um, there's a good few there actually on how to stop them from doing their business in their beds, um, how to stop them from weeing all over the house. I guess these are probably puppy questions. Puppy. Mm -hmm. um, puppy is, uh, um, you can, I'll, I'll be careful in the way I'm saying this, but um, you can teach uh, a dog to stop um, being around the house within a weekend, if you do it correctly. Um, depending on the dog's age. So that really depends on the dog's age. But um, at the beginning, the puppies, you need to bring them out for a few seconds every hour. So that means on the hour, put the timer, bring them outside. We teach with the guide dogs, uh, busy, busy, teach them to go on command. So that means when you tell them, you get rewarded. So first of all, you see the dog going down, you reward them, you then use the, 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 the words that is busy, busy and then bring them back inside. When they're very young puppy, they need to do it very often. So in, it's not, it's nothing wrong, is that the bladder is so small that he can only hold it for so long. Um, when the dog is older, and let's say between three to six months, um, it can, you know, mistakes can happen, but mistakes is only a mistake if 80% of the time he'll uh, he'll do it outside. So I do teach a command and it could be busy, busy, it could be anything else you, you find appropriate, but teach him to go when you go out and stay out with them until they go to the toilet. If you have a very young puppy, you're probably going to have to set up an alarm for you around four o'clock in the morning, bring him out five minutes, bring him back in. I don't bring you back in until you did your business outside. Most of the puppies we had around the house, we would be training them within uh, a weekend to do 80% of the time outside. Of course, a couple of mistakes are always going to happen. When they're young puppies, they can always happen. That's why we use the crate a lot, because when they're puppy, you know that you put them in the crate, it's a safe place. That most of the times they're not going to uh, pee inside the crate unless they really, really have to do it. Some dogs then they get trained to... Um, uh, to be toilet trained on, on the reverse. You bring them outside, they don't do anything. As soon as they come back in, they go to your carpet and they pee. Mm -hmm. Well, it's enough one time to wait until they do it and make sure you reward them. Reward is essentially in the toilet training. You need to see them as a command. It's not different to, to sit down and stay. You, you, sorry. You, you go to the toilet and you get rewarded. It's very, very simple. Um, but toilet training is can become a problem. And is if he brought for too long, then it can become a problem. So if a dog is going to pee always in the same spot around the house, what you need to do is uh, um, put his football and his water bowl on top of that spot. So uh, straight away, that is not going to go into that spot. So he's going to be looking for a new place. And once you see the dog nose on the ground and for more than two, three seconds, it means that dogs need to go to the toilet. That's why the crate is always very good because you can see him is going to start standing up. He's going to do a little movement first and then means it's time to go out. Um, once he's above four months, he can stay for three, four hours with no problem without going to the toilet, but I'm still going to bring him out every couple of hours. You know he can stay for four hours because he doesn't do it in the middle of the, in the, middle of the night more than once, but every couple of hours I still bring him out. One minute, 30 seconds, busy, busy, reward, bring him back in. Okay, okay. And another question about puppies is how do you stop them from going places in the house that you don't want them to go, for example, upstairs? I know you mentioned stair gates earlier. Is that yours? Absolutely. Is, is, they are essential. You know, puppy don't know any difference, especially if you're not there. You know, 
Sergate, you know, um, baby crate, baby gate, whatever you want to call them, or crate, you know, dog, if you don't want the dogs upstairs, that's fine, absolutely fine. Remember, it's all about consistency. So it doesn't, I, I, it makes not a better dog or worse dog if you have them upstairs, if you have them on the sofa, if you don't have them on the sofa. What makes them a better or worse dog is the consistency. So that means if the dog is not allowed on the sofa, it means he's never allowed on the sofa, even when you're not there. So if you're not there, it means he either doesn't have access to the sofa or is put in a situation that he can't go on the sofa by either putting a couple of chairs on the sofa or by putting on a crate. But if you let him go on the sofa when you're not there, that's not consistency. That means when you're not there, the dog is allowed. When you're there, the dog is not allowed. That doesn't stop the dog from jumping on the sofa. What is going to stop the dog jumping mm. on the sofa is by being consistent. So the dog is never allowed or is always allowed. You can't be allowed sometimes. Okay. That doesn't work. Yeah. I presume you have to have all family members on board as well with the consistency because it's not going to work unless everyone's on the same page. Yes, and uh, um, in general, the, the, the problems are uh, not the kids. Um, we, um, the, we uh, as men, are the problem, usually. We think we, uh, we know how to do it better, and we start to be inconsistent, start feeding the dog off the table once because we had the steak that we cooked, and we say, well, it's going to be lovely to give that piece of steak. Can't do that. You can you, you can, can you give a piece of steak to the dog? Absolutely, you can. But I'll use it as a reward. Nothing is free in the house, so that means we'll use it during training. You sit down, you stay. I don't feed you off the table. Do I, of course, I give a piece of steak if I cook the steak and there is some extra steak to my dog. If my dog doesn't have any problem with his stomach and is fine, I'll use it as a training. Uh, things but i just don't give it off the table um the kids unfortunately say you know you need to watch them depends on the age of your kids but you know um the rules you should write down the rules around the uh, for everybody in the house 10 15 rules what the dog is allowed and what is not allowed to do it and make sure everybody knows from the very beginning mm -hmm. and actually another one came in about food speaking of food how do you stop your dogs from wanting your food instead of their own food and i guess part of that is not feeding them from your table well, they, first of all, this part is not feeding them. But, you know, people say, well, I never fed my dog, but my dog is uh, waiting for me to give them something. Well, they can smell the difference between a uh, proper steak may be made on the barbecue and their dog food. OK, so there is a different smell. So the dog is not stupid either. Um, but I do tend to, uh, when I'm having dinner, the dog is either, you know, if he's very young, I'll teach him to go in his crate. If he's a bit older, I'll teach him to go into his mat. You know, I'll teach him mat, stay. I, I, it's not that I don't want the dog around the dinner table. I just don't think it's good for anybody. Um, it's not good for you. It's not good for the dog. So I usually feed the dogs as well at the same time while I'm feeding. And then at the beginning, it's going to come to you. You're going to ask him to go to his mat. You give him something else to chew and let him go into a different place. Um, and then use the, the food you want for, uh, for training. Uh, if you have visitors, that's not the time to start training the dog. So because we have another month of lockdown, uh, I would say by the time of the lockdown, all your dogs are being perfectly trained so to, you can have visitors. Uh, crate, if he's very young, a utility room, if he's a bit older, uh, or mat, if he's well-trained. Okay, okay. And how do you stop them from eating stones and plants when they're outside? Well, it, it, you know, it's uh, you just... These are usually very young puppies, um, and uh, stones can be extremely dangerous. Um, we've seen dogs that they unfortunately die because they 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 ate stones, and they 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 can become a big big problem. Um, again, it's replacing. You know, drop it, leave it, leave it, come back, sit down, reward. If you're not out there is most probably you can't do any of these. So you can only do it, that's when he's a young puppy, you can't allow the dog to be in the garden by himself. It's just not, you wouldn't allow your 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 kids being out in the garden when they're two, three years of age by themselves without you watching them. The puppies are no different. They will find something that is gonna be harmful for them. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's watching them really is the key. But yeah, um... plants, are, plants are great fun to dig you know there is digging mm. and destroying all at the same time so it's just about the redirection right so yeah, yeah. Um, 
that doesn't mean it happens all the time. Like, look, I'm a young puppy with me, so I know exactly, you know, what puppies do. And I had puppies all my life. And, you know, they're not perfect from, it's not that they arrive to me that they're already perfect and they spend a weekend with me and they become perfect. It doesn't work like that. I wish it was that easy. Um, it's, it's that been a, be that'd be great, right? You know, come to me and be, I, there is some acceptance, you know, the, the Puppies do puppy things, and it's normal. Um, it's just not to allow them to do it again, or by not making a negative, so that it doesn't have to go for, for it again. Puppies do want to go to plant and destroy them. Then it's up to you to make sure that you can recall them, make them come back, redirect them to do something else. Um, bring, you know, you need to bring a lot of things with puppies. Like um, I take, you know, lots of different things from cardboard boxes from uh, Amazon and let them destroy that inside their crate. To take a, a couple of uh, uh, plastic bottles, put a couple of uh, treats inside and let them destroy that. Um, use toilet roll close them down, a bit of cellar tape, and then a paper tape, actually, should say a bit better, and actually uh, get them uh, to destroy that. D dogs love to destroy things. They need to see the destruction. It's not enough, you know, to give them a toy that doesn't destroy. They need to see the destruction. That's why cardboard boxes are great. Then clean them up, make sure they don't eat them all, and then put them away. You know, dogs don't die if they eat a tiny bit of paper. They do die if they eat a stone. You know, so um, it's about moving to the war, to, you know, to the best of the wars, you know. So, but um, cardboard boxes are great to get them to destroy it and get a few minutes of a, um, time away from you and then get still a positive association with it. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Um... We've just gone so much over our time. There's so many questions. So thank you so much to everyone who sent in their questions and uh, apologies if we didn't get to everything, but I think a lot of questions were answered in, in your general advice anyway, Alex. Um, so just, you know, from a Bandon Co-op point of view, I just want to say thanks to Alex for being on the call today. Thank you. Um, I, you know, we, we actually do have a very large range of pet care and we can source things that we may not have in stock for customers if there's something specific that they're looking for. Um, also, in the next couple of weeks, we'll have our full pet care range on our website, so you'll be able to view that as well. Um, so thanks also to Ed and to Zach. I know Zach dropped out there. He had some internet issues, um, but thank you for being on the call with us. And again, just thanks so much, Alex, for your expertise. Um, it's amazing to get the insights. I mean, it is such a basic thing, really, but I think all the positive reinforcement is probably the way to go with the dog. and. You know, I guess, it, you know, taking that on board is very important for people. Yes. And, you know, if you really think um, about learning a bit more about dog training, um, I would suggest you more to learn first about how dog think um, more than what to do for training a dog. Um, there is a lovely book that is called Inside of a Dog um, that is called What Dog uh, See, um, Smell and Know. Um, understand more the behavior of the dog is coming more from understanding the dog itself. Um, the, the training most of the time is very, very simple. It's, dogs is by repetition, rewarding and consistency. Understand how the dogs see things. That's the best way to start. Okay, so what I might do actually, Alex, is get you to just share the, the title of those books with me and I can put them on the website for people along with the recording, if that's okay. Um, and you had some other videos that you were going to share too, so we can put those on with our recording as well. So people can Absolutely. see more. Yeah, that would be Absolutely. great. Absolutely. So I'll okay. share it with you. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. And thanks thanks a lot, again, Eric. Zach and Ed. Okay, thanks everyone Cheers. for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.